Disclaimer, these videos are meant to be a brief overview of the subject. They are written to meet time constraints while still conveying factual historical information. My sources for each video are in the video summary below and can get you started on a more in-depth look at the subject. On a personal note, if there is a way to mispronounce the name, I will do it. It is a gift and I am sorry about it ahead of time. Welcome to Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition. Today we're going to talk about the Battle of Perryville, Kentucky, located in Boyle County on October 8th. 1862, U.S. Major General Don Carlos Buell had been chasing Confederate Commander Bragg's forces for over a month. After utilizing a feint, Buell was able to trick Bragg into leaving half the Confederate forces near Frankfort, Kentucky, and stripping the defenses of Bardstown and nearby Perryville down to only 16,000 soldiers. As Buell approached Perryville on October 7th, Confederate Colonel Joseph Wheeler's cavalry engaged and skirmished with the Union while Confederate Major General William J. Hardy called upon Confederate troops to help defend against Buell's forces. The real battle began in the early morning hours of October 8th as Union skirmishers scouted for water and encountered Confederate troops on Peters Hill near the Turpin House. When this encounter happened, it started a battle in earnest as U.S. Colonel Daniel McCook and his men launched forward. They escalated to fighting all along the Springfield Pike. By mid-morning, fighting had subsided and Union General Sheridan positioned his men around the Turpin House, securing a home for his command center. Meanwhile, overall Union Commander Buell was unaware of the fighting as his command center was more than two miles away at the Dorsey House. The Confederates did not let grass grow under their feet as Commander Bragg ordered Major General Leonidas Polk to attack the enemy at Perryville. Moving his troops into the area, Polk's men began to set up for what they would hopefully be a flanking maneuver that would allow the Confederate forces to circle around the Union lines. The mistakes had been made and were realized when the Confederates did attack on what they believed to be the Union left flank, but instead found themselves slamming into the front of Major General Alexander McCook, 13,000 Union soldiers waiting, and at this point in time the fighting became intense. One quick note, yes, Alexander McCook was Daniel McCook's older brother, there were lots of McCooks fighting. They were known as the family of the fighting McCooks for the Civil War. We'll come back to that maybe later. Seeing the Confederate forces fighting, more reinforcements were sent, and eventually McCook's men had to slowly withdraw. During this action, Union Brigadier Generals James S. Jackson and William R. Terrell were both killed in action. Terrell specifically died as his men were crushed by Confederate Major General Benjamin Cheatham and his Tennessean and Georgian forces as they pushed forward. Sensing a possible breakthrough, Cheatham pushed his men forward and tried to take the Union batteries stationed along the Benton Road. Fighting was fierce, but the Union soldiers were able to slow the Confederates' advance before retreating back to higher ground. Meanwhile, around the H.P. Bottom House on Doctors Creek, the fighting had grown even harsher as Confederate General Bushrod Johnson advanced over the creek. Taking cover from heavy fire behind a large stone fence, Johnson attempted to push forward but was kept at bay. Additional Confederate forces were sent and eventually they were able to drive away the two Union brigades that held the area from higher ground. The Confederate troops pushed further and, and caught U.S. Colonel George P. Webster's brigade and pushed them back to the Russell House where Colonel Webster was mortally wounded trying to rally his men. Eventually though, the Confederates won the whole area by 6 p.m. that evening. The Union counterattacked the Confederates on the Union's left flank and with daylight fading, Confederate General Polk barely escaped death or capture when he rode up to the battle line to order who he thought were Confederate troops to stop firing at other Confederate troops. He found out that they were actually Union troops from the 22nd Indiana. Thinking quickly, he bluffed his way through the Union lines and returned safely back to the Confederate side. Darkness descended onto the battlefield, leaving the Confederate forces running out of time. They had hammered the Union forces that could claim a tactical victory, but the arrival of Buell's reinforcements meant that the Union troops would win the next morning. The Confederate forces decided to pull back and instead of holding Perryville, they would fall back to Harrodsburg. It should be noted that the commanders from both sides had repercussions to their actions from the last few months. Union Commander Buell was dismissed because of his overall performance and because he did not pursue Confederate Commander Bragg in more than a half-hearted way. He was replaced by Major General William S. Rosecrans, who would take over the reorganized army freshly named the Department of Cumberland, or the 14th Corps. It would later earn a more familiar name, the Army of the Cumberland. Meanwhile, Confederate Commander Bragg was ordered back to Richmond, Virginia to explain to Jefferson Davis the charges that Bragg's own officers had brought against him. They demanded that Bragg be replaced. Davis decided to leave Bragg in charge. However, Bragg's relationship with his own officers never recovered, and this would hamper him in the future. Casualties were fairly high for the battle, 
The Union suffered overall 4,241 casualties, including 845 killed, 2,851 wounded, and 515 captured and missing. The Confederates had received slightly less losses with a total of 3,396 casualties, comprised of 510 killed, 2,635 wounded, and 251 captured or missing. Please join us again next time on Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition.